Hey guys, real quick, before we hop into this interview, um, I wanted to just uh, kind of apologize for the audio at times. Um, what I was hearing in my headphones was the pre-mix, and what you guys are about to hear is the final mix, and come to find out my microphone volume was really, really low. So instead of me trying to like uh, do voiceover, which would have sounded weird and looked like this, I decided to try to recover the audio and although you you can hear everything I have to say, I apologize because I know it's probably going to get a little annoying at times. Um, but anyway, yeah, let's hop right into this interview. Thank you guys for watching. A disclaimer and a warning to anybody that's about to watch this video. The views and opinions in this video are just that, views and opinions. Everything you see is going to be done for research and entertainment purposes only. I do not advise nor condone the use of anything you're about to see in this video. Everything is just for entertainment purposes only. Whatever you do with the information you get from this video is all up to you. But ultimately, don't be stupid. Cool. All right. Well, Same. pants off, dicks out. What's up, guys? <laughs> all right. Fucking stoked that you guys are all here in this room together with me right now. Um, I don't want to waste any time, dude. I want to hop right into it because I'm sure this conversation is going to go along. But uh, Kenny, I just want to talk about the recent bodybuilding show. Mm -hmm. um, it was men's physique, right? Just yeah, correct. Wise. And you took first place? Yeah, first place in my okay. division. And a majority of what you were taking happened to be surrounded around SARMs, right? Yeah, all of what I was taking was so SARMs everything. only. So no anabolics or nothing like that? Mm -mm. Okay, what were you taking exactly? Um, I was taking high dose LGD 4033, RAD 140, and YK11. High dose of all three. Cool. So one of the like the promo pieces that I put together was somebody essentially saying, "Oh, SARMs ain't that great because nobody's you know doing anything special about them." So like in previous competitions, have you taken other stuff or has it always been just SARMs? Um, or natty, I should say. All my other previous competitions were natural. Okay. Yeah. So this was the first competition setting that had used any performance enhancing um, okay. type substances. So I have, did have previous experience with anabolics, but that was in my sports performance days. So it was nothing bodybuilding related. Mm -hmm. But as far as the competing world, this was the first official cycle, I guess yeah, is what you call the, it. Yeah, the highest that you've ever placed. Yeah. So that's actually a big topic, actually, because when I competed natural, I placed eighth at a uh, my last show, which was, I believe, two or three years ago now. And then as soon as, you know, obviously over the years, I've gained more muscle mass, of course, mm -hmm. but a lot of that is also due to the SARMs and the anabolics, of course. So, but running the SARMs only cycle, it's just that big difference in the conditioning, the dense, hard look, the muscle fullness, um, retaining a lot of muscle, of course, too, while you diet, because my prep was six weeks. And of course, if you're dieting natural, you're gonna sacrifice muscle along with that. So having any type of anabolic in the system, whether it's SARMs or actual anabolics themselves, will help you retain that muscle, if not put on more during your prep. Cool, and why did you guys go with that stack? Because were you coached by Tony? With all uh, no, this was all me. I would reach out to Tony and then also Mark Lobliner for occasional information regarding diet and supplementation. Um, Tony helped me immensely with like the clenbuterol uh, protocol, taking insulin or slim pills, not insulin, sorry, um, slim pills during like peak week for carving up and everything. So if I ever had a question or something that I was maybe doubting during the prep myself, I'd reach out to Tony or Mark. Um, do you think people truly believe that like uh, if they take SARM since they're not injecting, is that something that they would consider themselves to be like, oh, I'm natural because I'm just taking like orals? Yeah, I've had so many mixed opinions on it, man. <laughs> yeah. It's just so stupid, like some people's opinions on it. In fact, I was interviewing someone at the Anaheim Expo and we were talking about being natural or not. And, and uh, he said he was on SARMs and he's like, but I'm natural. And I'm like, eh, I don't think that makes you natural because yeah. it manipulates your hormones. So. Synthetic androgen. Yeah. And some people will thoroughly believe they're natural, even though they're taking SARMs, just because their perception of it is that they're not taking actual steroids themselves or doing injections. Mm -hmm. So they believe that anything oral still classifies them as a natural athlete. So there's always going to be those mixed opinions. So that's where it's really hard to crack down on who's natural or not, because some people's opinion on what that is is totally different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What did you guys take on like something like MK677? If I'm taking that, can I still claim Natty? I don't think so, personally, yeah, okay. but that's just my opinion. Okay, because I've just been having this discussion with somebody that actually works here. And it's like, man, I don't know. I don't think I want to hop on, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, hey, you can go to a doctor and get ibutamorin. You'll be fine. 
really like yeah dude <laughs> i think it's subjective to you know where what sport you're in or what yeah. you're doing because natty means natural so if we went back two thousand years how do you make mk it's, it's not happening right you know it's not natural to the environment so uh, when you say natty in a sport that could be different you didn't take anything exogenous i think that's what you could go for gotcha and they they actually have the natural steroid cycle, which is basically just kind of creating the environment to make more natural testosterone. So you use a little tiny AI to create a negative estrogen feedback loop, which would artificially raise your testosterone while you're doing that. So technically you would force yourself to naturally produce more, but like Trevor said, could you create that in nature to right. do that? No. I would relate MK677, which is a growth hormone secretagogue, to caffeine. You take caffeine, your body releases in response adrenaline and noradrenaline, epinephrine and norepinephrine. You take MK67, your body releases a natural hormone, which is growth hormone, in response. I would say MK677 is equally natural to caffeine. A lot of people consider caffeine natural. It is absolutely unnatural. I don't care if it, if it exists in in na nature it's not natural because it's actually a plant toxin that causes your body to release adrenaline to try to clear out the toxin and the same sort of mechanism of action of causing your body to release a natural hormone is what's happening with every testosterone booster and every growth hormone secretagogue i think they're all similarly situated gotcha so ryan you're the quiet guy over here do you go by ryan or russo oh uh, russo everyone calls me okay. honestly how old are you i'm 22. okay does that freak your family the fuck out um it did for a while until i like my girlfriend's mom is a nurse practitioner and like she really wasn't that afraid and like kind of calmed everyone down honestly she like she doesn't care and like like if she cares then yeah. you know it's serious but uh was sarms the first thing you hopped on or did you hop on anabolics no i i try to do everything so when i first started back when i was 18 playing around with sarms like no one was documenting them at all like they do today and i was researching and i read through all the medical studies and then i went to go on the bodybuilding forums and i'm like there's really no one posting pictures everyone's just pretending to be this guru so i decided to just start uploading like okay i'm gonna start this cycle and i'm gonna video document exactly what happens and all my side effects and everything so i wanted to do everything sarms only first because everyone's like oh you can't get any results with sarms like sarms don't work yeah. back then it was way more prevalent that like sarms were complete snake oil i think nowadays enough people have tried them to realize that they're really strong androgens but back then everyone's like oh sarms don't work so the issue i ran into as i got to these stronger sarms like s23 was that i was crashing my estrogen so it was my estrogen. So I noticed around week seven, I wouldn't continue gaining and I'd have erectile issues. And that's because SARMs don't convert to estrogen or DHT and they suppress testosterone, which means you're going to get no estrogen conversion. So then that brought me over to using testosterone under it. I really haven't played around with very many anabolics, honestly, besides testosterone. And I've tried MPP trend Until this week. <laughs> yeah, until this week, and I tried everything under the sun. Yeah. <laughs> but and so, how old were you when you first hopped on? Um, real cycle or SARMs? Uh, well, yeah, just your first anything considered PEDs. Um, my first SARM cycle, I think it was only like four weeks, but it was at eighteen. No. Oh, oh shit, eighteen. Okay. Yeah. And you're twenty-two now. So, what does that look like at thirty-two? I don't really plan on pushing the dosages okay. that much harder than gotcha. they currently are, honestly. Yeah, and then so do you have like friends in high school or like siblings or something that look at you and they're just like, like, dude, like, what are you doing? Honestly, no. Everyone's respected me for what I did, honestly. They just respect my honesty. A lot of my friends in high school used steroids and I was Mr. Natural. Like, I was always trying to buy all these supplements and like, falling into all those money loopholes of spending all these money on sawdust powders yeah. and then i started eventually researching what really worked and i just wanted to be open and honest about it i think everyone just respects me for being honest because people are interested like how these people get these crazy physiques like mm -hmm. it's not really well known how you get this hollywood physique 
or this crazy mass monster physique. I think people are just interested to see it all laid out so they can kind of analyze it for themselves. Yeah, and so like, what are you guys doing to make sure? I know you guys are doing something pretty uh, pretty intense right now, but like, are, how often are you getting blood work or like, are you doing something else to make sure that like you're still healthy? So my dosages aren't really that high normally. So it's like, not that high. So 300 to 350 megs of test and then the SORM on top. That's really all I do normally. Obviously, t this week was different, yeah. but I normally get bloods done every six months. And really, the only thing that's really skewed is my cholesterol because that's what happens when you go on testosterone. But my overall cholesterol is still good, but my HDL is definitely lower from being on testosterone. Is that what you guys recommend for like you know making sure your levels are cool? Is, it bl is blood work kind of like the end all be all, or is there something else that people can be looking for? Blood work doesn't show everything. Uh, it's really helpful because it helps you diagnose something early. It, it, how you feel is one thing. Uh, your blood pressure, your blood glucose, your body weight, these are all things that could let you know what's going on inside and blood work's another extension of that. But it, it won't tell you everything that's going on. Uh, but it helps preventatively. So most people who are having uh, steroid side effects or SARM side effects or something, there will be some evidence somewhere in the blood work, but it's like a puzzle and it, and it won't let you exactly isolate the issue, but hopefully it'll let you know that you need to look into it earlier. You need to back off. Okay. So yeah, blood work is helpful, but it's still not the end all be all. Gotcha. Then um, for everybody here, I asked Tony this before, but why do you guys think that like some of the hardcore anabolic users just simply bash SARMs and say that it's not worth it? I'll say a couple reasons and then they can yeah. follow up. Uh, one, because I've experienced all of these. Uh, one is the mainstream supplement industry doesn't want people to know that there's more effective, cheaper things out there. Two is the underground steroid world doesn't want people to know SARMs can replace steroids because steroids have a huge markup. Uh, they're way more profitable than SARMs. SARMs are not profitable compared to steroids. And the steroid companies don't want to sell SARMs because then they're going to sell less of the higher profit steroids. Uh, and when they do sell SARMs, usually it's just spiked with steroids because then people will get an effect, uh, but it costs them a lot less to do it. Like D-ball costs is so much less than SARMs. It's, it's, it's insane. It's like one, one tenth the price, yeah. for what example. About, what about people that don't have like a stake in the game? Like we've had people on the podcast that are just, you know, just regular gym bros, have no affiliation. Uh, yeah. Now I understand they could be you know, like friend of a friend, right? That has you know some stake in the game, but for the most part, it doesn't seem like they do. In my experience, it's usually uh, ignorance and ego and not willing to admit that they don't know about an entire new chapter of the fitness industry that could change everything. And so they're trying to hold on as long as possible t for their old knowledge to be relevant, even though if they don't know about SARMs, they're pretty much outdated because SARMs are so much more advanced and replace most of the anabolics that exist. Trevor, what do you think? Yeah, I think exactly what he's saying. I think it's just a lack of information. So when you get into this, what do you do? How to take the ball, how to take testosterone. That's, that's just your go-to cycles. Mm -hmm. They're not a part of cycles anymore. So if we can just teach what SARMs can do and how they work, because there's so little research done on humans and dosing. Well, there's some dosing protocols they've had five to 20 milligrams a kilo. And we're doing five milligrams to 10 milligrams for a person. So just teaching ignorance, I think. That's the biggest. Yeah, do you guys agree with that? I think it's also a matter of social media because I mean, if you watch any YouTube video, anyone criticizing a physique or talking about a physique, the key words you always hear is Trembolone, Winstrol, Masteron, Testosterone. Um, you don't ever hear people throw SARMs names in there. Yeah. So anyone that's new into the industry or anything, they're right off the bat already getting those names just planted into their brain. So they're already thinking Tremblone, Winstrol, Masteron, all these compounds are what are making these physiques and they're not actually seeing the new studies out there. So it's almost this unwillingness to change and people just want to stick to what they know and what's been around forever, which is of course the anabolics. So anytime there's something new on the market, people I feel like aren't going to talk about it as much and they're just going to go back to what they know best. Well, 10, 10 to 11 years ago, because I, I was looking for anything I could use, you know, to make a combination, a good combination of, mm -hmm. of anabolics. Here, look closer, Mike. And so when, when I found SARMs, 
I was really interested, right? Oh, they don't do this, they don't do that. Okay, why? And from the information back then, it was just, what, that's all they can do is bind to an androgen receptor. Once that happens, it's done. And only on skeletal tissue. So in my mindset, what's the point? You know, there's no point. It's not as anabolic, say, as Tren. It doesn't give the effects of Tren. Why would I take it? And then I came back, I actually met Tony, went back, started getting research from people and reading. I'm totally different. Totally different. Yeah. Do you hear anything else? Like I've had a lot of hardcore users, like really big steroid users, like really big dudes, come into my DM box and be like, you know, I thought SARMs were bullshit. I watched a bunch of your videos and read everything. I decided to give them a try. And some, like, they love them. Like, honestly, they think that they're high power, non toxic orals. Yeah. I think it comes into consideration, like, how people are going about doing their SARM cycles, where, like, 10 milligrams of Austrian, like, you can't expect to explode on 10 megs of Austrian. But if you add in 30 megs, 20 megs of S23 on top of, you know, testosterone, that's basically like mimicking Winstrol on top of testosterone without the. DHT. Yeah. If, if you look at any of the dosing, say LGD recommended dose, um, our Austrian, let's say, what is it, 15 milligrams, right? 15? 10 to 15. 10 to 15. If you took that of D ball or Anavar, what are you going to get out of that? The same, a SARM. It's going to do the same thing, but less produce less muscle. So, what happens if you took the same dose of any one of these oral anabolics? that we do for steroids. So that can show you the gap, 150 milligrams Anadrol versus 20 milligrams of LGD. Now go to 150 of both. One disclaimer, Andrew, is that you asked us in general why these people may think this way, but if you gave us a very specific example, like who said something and what did they say, we can analyze it much more specifically. So it's a disclaimer to the audience that uh, you know, if, if, if you have them with something more specific, we can give you a more specific answer. We're just yeah. being very general. Yeah, I mean, and that's, that's the uh, a problem. I wish I could come up with an answer, but people usually bash them. They don't have any, any real weight behind it. Well, I, yeah, I'll give just an example. Most of the people on YouTube that I've heard talk about SARMs who bash them have no idea what SARMs are, how they work, haven't experimented with themselves, or if they did, they used them incorrectly, or they used fake SARMs, we touched on before, is yeah. a, a huge problem was for a very long period of time before EA came on the scene, there was a lot of fake SARMs, and people weren't getting the effects that, that they're getting now or that they got when EA was around. Uh, and so you have all these bulletin boards of data where people are reporting their SARM cycles, but they're actually reporting something that was spiked with pro-hormone yeah, steroids pro-hormone. or completely fake. So you've got a lot of fake data. So when Russo was saying he's one of the first people that reported in a video content his experiences, it's actually very valuable data because you could actually see him, see his body, see the honesty in his face, see what he's taking, and then you've kind of pinpointed all the, nailed down all the variables. You actually have much better, more reliable data than all the forums out there that's flooded with, especially on the forums, are absolutely flooded with paid people to take a certain position either for or against. It's extremely biased. And I didn't realize that when I first started researching on the forums. It, it wasn't until later, until I worked my way into the underground and started working with some of these companies and meeting some of these people and realizing how many paid people on the forum and they have 5,000 posts. You think that this person's been around for 10 years and they're reporting factual data, but for the last 10 years, they've been a rep for all these different companies taking all these different positions that are, have nothing to do with truth. They're just uh, marketing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How, this might be a really weird question, but like how prevalent are SARMs in this like realm? So are you asking like how to spot if someone's like on SARMs? Uh, we, we can go there, but I was just saying like, you know, you walk around like a fitness expo mm -hmm. and someone's saying like, I don't do steroids, mm -hmm. but it's like, well, fuck man, like you're probably on SARMs. Like, so that's what I was saying. Like, is it that prevalent now? Like, cause before all this, I had no idea that it even, there was like a, like a sub sub division of like, you know, PEDs. And so now it's like, okay, shit, okay, that person's not injecting, but they're most likely on SARMs now. Mm -hmm. Like, is it that prevalent? Yeah, I think with the anabolics, it's kind of easy to spot because of mm -hmm. the high side effects, and a lot of people are really bad at mitigating those. So you'll see, like, 
the hardcore acne, the hair loss, the gyno. Um, there's a lot of, yeah, like key things to really look for. <laughs> but with SARMs, I think it's a lot harder to spot. They might have the insane physique, very similar to that, someone that uses steroids, but they're not going to have those side effects that go along with it. So it's a lot harder to spot. For instance, the Olympia, I think of 2018, I interviewed a guy who I thought for sure was on steroids, but showed very little sides. So I interviewed him, asked him if he was natural, and he said no. And so I said, what are you on? And he told me MK677 or the growth hormone secretagog and then a bunch of other SARMs. So it's definitely prevalent and it's definitely out there because a lot of people, I think, as time progresses, are starting to catch on to it and starting to use that over anabolics themselves. Yeah, I, th I think SARMs only give like the elite natty look on YouTube because when you add gear into the mix, you get the water retention, you get like the freaky nitrogen retention. But I remember when I was doing SARMs, I only like, I definitely looked enhanced like when I got pumped up, but I didn't like freakily pop and have a bunch of nitrogen retention going on. But my strength was absolutely like bonkers enhanced and was like not natural yeah. whatsoever. But when it comes to spotting someone, I feel like it's more the elite natty look where you're like right on that cusp. Yeah. You can pretty much take it all the way to your genetic potential. And then if you want to go past that, that's when you add in the testosterone. Yeah. Is it as simple as people just don't want to admit that they're taking SARMs? Because uh, you said that there's people winning shows that are taking just SARMs. Is it just because they don't want to let everybody, everybody know the secret? <laughs> like, I mean, obviously the fake natties, right? But even people that are like on stage and it's like, all right, you're you're definite like you you're not winning <laughs> this competition unless you're on something. Is it as simple as just like they don't want to share their like little secret? I, I did think it's the same thing as steroids. Very few bodybuilders that are using steroids, which is all of them, uh, will come out and say they're using steroids mm -hmm. to compete. And also very few will come out and say they're using SARMs to compete. And it's for a lot of the same reasons. Uh, and you could go through a whole list of them, but uh, you know they don't want to ruin their opportunity to get a sponsorship by saying their muscle was built by SARMs instead of the protein powder or whatever they're representing. Okay. And then also ego. They don't want people to blame their hard work or discredit their hard work based on taking a substance that gave them an edge. Uh, they also don't want to give their secret away. If they found a SARM combination or steroid combination that worked really well for them, most competitors in every type of athletics, not just bodybuilding, will hold that secret uh, and keep it to themselves and not share it, usually. Now, it's I have in a unique position because I advise a lot of people or I help or give them my experiences that they will reach out to me and ask my opinion on these cycles. So I know that um, I know all the competitors are on steroids and I know a lot of them are on SARMs and I know even more are using SARMs plus steroids now is becoming very popular because then you kind of get the best of both worlds. You can lower your steroid dosages uh, by using SARMs so you get less side effects but you still get the same benefit by combining both which is my my protocol which is what i do is i combine steroids with the sarms now uh touch back on a previous question about what competitors are using we did a lot of experiments trevor and i with very high dosages of sarms to see if we could get steroid like benefits even in bodybuilders that had far beyond their natural amount of muscle like they you'd think that if they built all this muscle on steroids there's no way they could go to something weaker like sarms and make any progress they need to at least take the amount of steroids that they took to get their amount of muscle to maintain and then take even more steroids but what we found is by mega dosing the steroids we get uh the same if not better effects sorry if it, by mega dosing the sarms we get the same if not better effects than increasing the dosage on steroids and what's a uh, mega dose for example, we had two heavyweight bodybuilders on 50 milligrams of oral ligandrol in addition to a low dosage of testosterone and maybe some like D-ball pre-workout, for example. And that replaced maybe doing an extra 800 milligrams of equipoise or 800 milligrams of DECA or something like that. They got even better results than if they would have added those steroids in and in with less side effects. And then now we're to the point where we're actually injecting the SARMs. Yeah, and as part of this protocol, we all injected ligandrol. Mm -hmm. So how effective are injectable SARMs? Game changer. 
Absolute game changer. Like death of anabolics game changer? <laughs> yes. Well, Crazy but they still work strong. synergistically because each steroid has a property. So you might use a Winstrol to dry out and pull the water off your body for the competition look. And you know, it, it, in, and you might not get that quite that level of effect with an Asarm. But if we're looking at just muscle gain, actually putting on lean muscle, uh, not the look, then yes, injectable Sarms are more potent than steroids most of the time. Dude, that's great. Like, you know, I, I, I might ask some silly questions that you guys would be like, why the fuck is he asking that? But people just don't know. Mm -hmm. When I asked for a mega dose, he said it was like about 50 milligrams. I got hit up by a dude that said, because uh, the recent episode I just put out uh, this of this week, so by the time this video goes out, it'll be a long time from now. But um, I had a, uh, a BHRT doctor uh, recommend that I stay at 20 milligrams of Osterine. He said when he heard that, he started panicking because he's taking 100 milligrams of Osterine. Huh. He can't figure out what's going on. That's really toxic at 100. Each, yeah. each SARM has different potency per milligram. So when I, I said 50 milligrams of Ligandrol is a mega dose, injection of 50 milligrams of Ligandrol is insanely powerful. Uh, 100 milligrams of S23 is insanely powerful. 100 milligrams of Osterine? I haven't seen miracles come out of it. So you started with Osterine for a reason. It's one of the weaker SARMs. It's a great starting place, but there seems to be a, an upper limit of what it can do. Like you can keep going up in dosage and Osterine and at a certain point, you're not going to get any more out of it. Yeah. But some of these other SARMs like Ligandrol, I haven't found the upper limit of what it can do. And we keep increasing the dosage and we keep growing faster. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, because at 20 milligrams, I gained 15 pounds. At 30, I haven't gained much. Yeah. So. I did 100 on it, and it seemed to, it made me sick. Like, yeah. I felt sick. Maybe I had a hip. It was the only one I didn't check my liver on either. And it, I did not feel good, just a general sense of not feeling good. And so I don't see any too much benefit to that other than the company's making money. Mm -hmm. But it is a good starter, like you said. And uh, there, it's all based on the injection bioavailability difference and then clearance how in the half-life mm -hmm. so the carrier might make it last 24 hours yeah and then you're only getting 50 percent orally now you get to say 90 percent and then you get more out of the drug that way yeah i was just thinking like damn you like what does this guy do that's a lot of money <laughs> <laughs> so, so andrew if you this goes back to the theory when we first started talking before sarmageddon is we start with a low dosage of a compound and you either keep increasing the dosage as you desensitize to it or you switch compounds or you take a break. Those are the three options. So it's probably time for you now to switch compounds. You could take the Osterine if you're at 30 milligrams, you said? Yeah, right now. Yeah. You could take the 30 milligrams, you could take it down to 10 just to keep a foundation in and then you could add in another SARM that's gonna be your, your main SARM to build muscle. Mm -hmm and start at a low dosage and again, taper up again. And you'll you'll go back to it when the very beginning, when you started making really fast gains off that low dosage, you'll make that same progress all over again and just keep going up. Yeah, so that's my next question. So this is officially week 12. Um, how, like I think our original protocol was gonna go three and a half months and ending at 40 milligrams uh, of Osterine. Um, but like in your guys' experiences, like how long have you ran a cycle of SARMs? Six years. <laughs> I mean, I, I just keep alternating between SARMs and steroids yeah. and I barely come off at all. Uh, but I, the body generally, when it comes to anabolics, it stops responding as well somewhere around, you know, four to six weeks, something like that. Trevor, would you agree that like, cause it depends on the length of the ester. SARMs would be considered something that's almost like a no ester or a short ester because it's in your system quickly. It's out of your system quickly. So you'd kind of relate that to like an NPP or a, or a testosterone propionate or. Yeah, because the SARM will clear the body fast and it gives you a break from it. And during that break time is when we're talking about homeostasis and myostatin. If you keep something bound to that receptor 24 seven and it's supposed to lower myostatin, eventually it starts to catch up when it realizes it. That's why cycles, people start talking about cycling and but if you can do it on a smaller smaller level you can run them a lot longer without, without having to do that 
So we, you can switch compounds every two weeks. You can switch compounds every two days, actually, right? So, but there's definitely a law of diminishing returns where the body sort of fight starts fighting against you after, let's say, six weeks. So, yeah, time to switch. Is that like in your like what have you done in the past? Back when I documented, I did um, mostly I would go eight to 12 weeks solo run. I noticed that my testosterone was pretty suppressed if I had no base of testosterone around week seven is when I would start to notice the crash. So I never really pushed beyond that. Obviously on a base of 250 of testosterone, you could probably go for months as long as your tex toxicity is kept within check. But most of my SARMs only experiments were four to 12 weeks. And is that with like on cycle therapy or anything like that? <laughs> that was with no on cycle therapy. And then I would do post cycle therapies after. Yeah. Is that about the same for you too, Kenny? <laughs> Like, no, yeah. I, I was the classic beach bro during the summer that Same. ran a SARM cycle for probably <laughs> like four months straight. Yeah. Um, and then of course ran like PCT after, but I don't know if it's my genetics or what, but if I've ever been suppressed, I bounce back almost immediately, regardless if I ran a PCT or not, I could probably not run PCT, but, uh, but I recommend everyone does of course. Yeah. Um, but something about my genetics, my testosterone just always bounces right back. Um, but I definitely felt it, especially after that long, definitely started to notice that it wasn't even really affecting me anymore. I was just more so taking it as a daily supplement just to take it. Um, so there's definitely a threshold where it's like you either, you know, as Tony touched on, want to increase the dosage or swap out compounds or, um, take time off, resensitize to the SARMs because, you know, just take me for example, I was like the classic guy that was like, I could just run this indefinitely and yeah. I'll continue to gain muscle, continue to be shredded for the summer and look great and everything. And it definitely gets to a point where it stops. And, yeah. and what were you taking for those four months? Um, let's see, this was two summers ago. It was probably, I believe, MK2866 or Austrain, um, S4. And I believe that was the only two with like cardarene on and off here and there. And then are you doing like blood work to just make sure like your test levels are coming back? Yeah, I do blood work probably like once a year. I did blood work specifically after that SARM cycle just because of how long it was. Mm -hmm. And as I mentioned, like um, my test was pretty much already back to normal, like just a couple weeks after taking that SARM cycle. So Andrew, it's not just your body's sort of desensitizing or myostatin catching up with the specific SARM you're taking at a specific dosage for a specific period of time. It's also your natural testosterone levels going down and your estrogen levels going down. So if you were to add in estrogen or testosterone- just take a birth control pill. Exactly. You could, if you didn't want to take a shot, you could start taking birth control pills while on uh, the SARMs and you would start getting better uh, results again. But the birth control pills are going to also suppress your testosterone even more. So you're going to have that estrogen that you're pro which is probably your limiting factor in muscle growth right now, but you're also going to suppress testosterone more. So birth control is a uh, worst case scenario. That's something oral you could take. Uh, if you're going to take something for injection, there's HCG or ultimately the best would be something like testosterone because then you'll get the conversion to DHT and estrogen plus the testosterone. You're sort of getting three hormones in one. And your testosterone will sit at a current like ester yeah. level, not like a natural spike. So you'll have they a can, constant androgen level. They can keep it all oral too. They have Andrel. So you can take a oral testosterone and just okay. take it with your SARMs, your daily dose. Yeah, that's something I'll definitely look into. How about for uh, fertility though? Uh, just run the HCG. It depends on how long you're gonna be on it and dose. Cause they'll put people on TRT um, and HCG together. Mm -hmm. And then when they come off TRT, they keep them on HCG a little bit and they seem to be even better, so. Yeah, that's the only thing that I'm like concerned of, like right now with everything is like if I, for whatever reason, if I try and we can't make a baby, it's gonna be like, oh dude, look, it's all come back now. You know, like mm -hmm. that's the one, but. But then the other side is you, your money's freed up. So you gotta look at both <laughs> yeah. sides. Look at both sides. Okay. Yeah. You can't always control the yeah. outcome. So during the SARM cycle to help maintain fertility or at least keep things operating uh, or prevent atrophy. So when you come off, your fertility comes back quicker. What I do is take HCG and Clomid and I just do that for one week per month. The Clomid's just a pill and it's cheap. It's uh, it, they, they prescribe it for women and men for fertility and it has no side effects if you take it just for a short period of time. And you'll also produce a lot bigger semen load if your Sick. girl's into that. <laughs> uh, but the HCG is a shot. 
but it's an insulin needle and it's a very, it's like one little drop of water you just have to inject under the skin. It's like nothing, you don't even feel it. So if you ever feel like bridging the gap, that's your that's your gateway into injection. Well, it's funny, it's because I've been thinking like, well, no, now that's not about me, right? Like I mm -hmm. have to get my fertility up, so let's go. Um, I've never had like any attention as far as like uh, anybody watching a YouTube video where like I am like, you know, the reason why they're watching. So I've been having a lot of people reach out to me like through the DMs and stuff. Um, I've had a lot of like young people too. Um, I'm sure you've dealt with this too, but like, what are you guys thoughts on like, uh, let's say like 15 to 18 year olds wanting to hop on SARMs? I, I want to hear Kenny's, I, I, Kenny's response first. Yeah, I, I just keep Do you know how many DMs I get about this daily? I mean, Probably like a hundred a day. Yeah, dude, <laughs> it's like, I, I don't know what to say because it's like, I, I'm a little hypocritical, right? But I just, like in the uh, the first video I ever made, I'm like, yeah, if you're under 25, like just, you know, move on. But at the same time, I'm just like, I mean, so what ends up happening is they'll ask me where, where to get it. And I'll be like, ah, oh, dude, you're too young. Like you have so much room to grow. And then they'll send me a picture of like some bullshit that they bought. Like, oh, look what I got. Like, you just fucked yourself. Mm -hmm. Dude, like really bad. Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm like, I don't know what to say. Like, yeah, I don't know what to do now. So I don't know, what are your, what are your guys' thoughts? I always tell my recommendation is always like around 25 is ideal for any type whether it's SARMs or steroids or whatever you're getting into um, I tell people 18 it's pretty much your choice you know you're technically an adult you can make your own decisions at that point I'm not going to control what you do with your life but as far as my recommendation and what I wish I knew back then I wish I personally hadn't started anything until 25 um, I think I would have built a stronger foundation naturally got to my natural potential and then continue to build off of there. Plus all your natural hormones and everything are already capped at that level versus, you know, throwing all these different anabolics and everything into the yeah. equation and throwing that all askew. How old are you right now? Sorry. I'm 26 right now. Okay. When did you start? Um, let's see, like anabolics was 19. Well, I was a Winstraw only cycle for football. Um, then after that, SARMs, I believe, was probably 21, 22, something around that range, I believe. Um, but yeah, that's as far back as it dates for me. But yeah, I'll have people in my DMs all the time that are 14, 15, asking what steroid cycle or what SARM cycle they should take to put on mass. And then they'll send me, of course, you know, their body transformation pictures, which I hate when I get those pictures all the time. <laughs> if you're ever watching this and you send me a body transformation picture, just expect me not to reply because it's like my least favorite thing to get in my DMs. Yeah. But nudes only. Yeah. Especially, <laughs> nudes <when> only. <laughs> Especially in public, um, you're at line in Starbucks or with your girlfriend. And all of a sudden, this half-naked picture of some hairy guy shows up, nice. and you're like, "Gosh." <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, it's like these 14 year olds that have no muscle at all. You can tell they haven't even been in the gym at all. And they're already like, just because of the hype behind it and how much is talked about in the industry, yeah. they feel that that's the magic pill. That's what's going to make them turn into Michael Hearn overnight. So it's this well, big natty, misconception though. of it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so that's why I tell them stay natty until, you know, as long as you can. So, yeah. but it's just such a problem, I feel like, because there's always these teams that want the next biggest physique. They want the physiques of the guys that are 30 years old that have been training for, you know, 10 plus years of using anabolics. And they, no one wants that long process of hearing that it's going to take 10 plus years of training to achieve a hard, dense looking physique because everyone wants those instantaneous results, just like everything else in life. They want money overnight. They want, you know, to live in their dream house overnight. They want everything instantaneous. Yeah. And it goes the same for steroids or SARMs. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure you've dealt with that. So many. Norm normally I start attacking them. I'm like, okay, like what's your blood work look like? Yeah. And then obviously these kids don't have blood work. I'm like, so you want to fuck up all your hormones without even knowing what your hormones were at? Yeah. And then, then I'll like ask them for their stats and I'll be like, all right, you're not even close to like natural FFMI, fat free mass index. So like, why don't you try to get towards them there first? And then I say like, why are you even asking some random dude on the internet to make this decision for you? Like, why do I have to make this decision for you? Like if I, if you have to ask someone else to make a decision like this for you, like you shouldn't do it. And that's, that's the way I try to get through to them. But I've had so many pictures of like people send me vials of stuff and I look at the person, I'm like, you know, I just instantly block them. Like, I just, I can't. Yeah. And I think like, so what, what you just said about like, okay, show me your blood work. And it's like, uh, okay, that's huge. Like, I think 
All right, people come to me like they want me to diagnose them without anything. Like they're like, I'm having gyno, bro. My dick's not working, and I'll be like. Okay, <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> and I'll Don't ask him for a new one, <laughs> and like asking them to get a hundred dollar blood panel is like asking them to like go like way out of their way. And Starbucks could get with a hundred bucks. Though? Yeah, that's Mom's exactly it, so. their their oh, okay. method of attack. With I don't that. Want to sound too cheesy. I'm gonna get bashed for it big time. But like, if you can't respect Sarms enough to get blood work done, like maybe this isn't for you. Well, we had a few guys that have hepatitis, and their their liver will skyrocket. Shit. Like, they can't take some of them. Yeah. So there are certain effects that they give you that they'll show up on your blood. Yeah. Because And I say that because there was a guy that came in this weekend for the seminar, and he's like, dude, Sarmageddon saved my life. And I'm like, please continue. Uh, <laughs> you know, like, this is dope. Uh, so he wanted to do everything I did, so he got his blood work done, and turns out his testosterone was like 130. So he's like, instantly I figured out, oh, this is why the past like five years have been terrible for me. And then asking these younger people about like to go get their blood work done, I've noticed that a lot of these people between 17 and 22 actually really have really low natural testosterone. Yeah. And then that's from like, oh man, like this is going to mess up their the way they mature. So even them just looking into it you know now they can actually get a doctor to prescribe them trt and they can feel better and they can just have a much different quality of life throughout their 20s and they probably wouldn't even have known that unless they're looking into androgens yeah and that's what it was for this guy he's just like i thought sarms was going to be the answer for me but it turns out like no my low test was the whole issue the whole time so now he's on trt and he's like thriving mm -hmm. holy shit all because of the stupid youtube video that i made <laughs> so i really wish i had gotten my blood work done earlier i mean I, I got my cholesterol tested and certain other small things but like a full blood panel with all the hormones so yeah it's you're, you're gonna regret it anybody who's young who's ever considering taking this stuff they're gonna realize someday oh i can never go back in time and see what my natural levels were i'll yeah. never know it my rest of my life i'll never be able to go it's back and get really it. critical to have that baseline blood work done because if you bounce back and you're like at 800 you started mm -hmm. but you come back to 600 that's still really high, but your libido still might be messed up from that 200 point drop. And the doctor's going to be like, well, it's still in range. You're good, bud. Yeah. When you could be having issues. Yeah. So Andrew, your last question that Kenny has answered and Russo has answered is what do you tell kids or not kids, but you know, 18 to 25 year olds who want to jump on uh, SARM cycles or, or anabolic cycles? What, what do you tell them? What do you wish you had done? Uh, so Trevor and I have opposite answers i think or, or different answers so i'll let trevor go first and then i'll give oh, you, my you answer first. you go first <laughs> well my 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 answer well, okay so yeah yesterday he said he wished he had stayed natural like a lot longer i wished i had started anabolics or sarms much younger because i trained so hard and i ate perfect and i did everything right and i reached my natural potential somewhere around age 21 and my body was just not going to hold much more muscle than that I spent from age 21 to age 30 basically wasting my time, so much time in the gym, taking, spending so much money on supplements, beating my body up, my elbows, my joints, my knees, where I could have made so much more progress in a shorter period of time and saved all that time and spent it on something even more productive. Because I, even though bodybuilding and building muscles is something I'm very passionate about, there's also other things I'm passionate about. I would have liked to have taken a little bit of that time I spent in the gym or especially worrying about my diet or doing cardio and applied towards some other skill in my life and, and become more holistically, you know, better at, at many different things. So I wish I had started when I was 21, maybe even younger. Um, I would have actually liked to, I, I don't, I, once I reached what I think was my natural height, I wouldn't have wanted to stunt my growth. So once I would have reached what I think my natural height was, that's when I would have wished I would have started something yeah. anabolic. Right, your growth plates fuse with excess estrogen. So anyone who takes testosterone around 17 could fuse some growth plates and then some growth plates could stay open. So it could grow wonkily. And one more point about it is that I do think that the we have a lot of estrogenic environmental toxins and things suppressing our natural testosterone. And I think it would have been more natural for me to at least get on something to increase my testosterone level in puberty because you sort of had this window of time in puberty where you really get to 
not change your genetics, but really change your body for life. And I wish I would have been on more in performance enhancing drugs in my teenage years that I could have kept that benefit. Now, when I was in my teenage years, I did have a little bit of this mentality. I said, I know whatever I do while my body is growing, I'll be better at my whole life. So I did start weightlifting and Taekwondo and stretching and just trying to increase my performance and my aesthetics while I was growing. So it would become easier for me later. So my body would become more of an asset than a liability. And I, I do think that worked just the same way that you see a swimmer. You always know when you see a swimmer, their structure, their, their wide shoulders, their V taper, that usually swimmers look awesome. And it's because while they were in puberty, their body sort of grew and adapted to the stress they were putting on it. So I think those adolescent years are critical. And I, a lot of people would hate me for saying this, but I think adolescent years is a great time to really push athletics to its limit and even use things to enhance. Gotcha. Trevor, you're so jacked. <laughs> Trevor's gonna, <laughs> Trevor's gonna <laughs> object <laughs> heavily. You know, you um, so it's a, it's a conundrum because I'm here today because I was doing that when I was 18. If I went natural, I wouldn't have as many problems. I don't know where I'd be in life. I'd finish school, I don't know, do something. I, I would have no idea where that route would have went, but I do know, like when I came along with EA, it was negative for me at first, but in the end, it, I think it pretty much saved me from jail or dying. And then I got to find my kind of calling. So all my school years weren't wasted. So if, if I was, natural maybe i would be making five hundred thousand dollars a year or maybe i would hate my life maybe i'd be doing the same thing i was doing and then that has a half-life on it so it's a conundrum mm -hmm. but it yeah. worked out yeah mark talks about it all the time like we had a whole podcast about like what if i didn't do steroids and it's like so many doors huh. did shut but how many doors got open because of it right like and i mean that's how i feel today like I'm fucking, I'm talking to you guys. Like, this is really cool. Like this whole experience. And just because of like all the research that I have been doing, my job has gotten better because the conversations that we now have on the podcast, I'm more like, a, I don't know, just, it, I'm more in tune to what's going on. It's, it's, it's amazing. So in regards to opening doors and whatnot, this whole generation iron thing that you guys are doing, um, this video won't be out for a while. So you can share as much information. It won't spoil anything by the time that all comes out. You know, this will finally bear, but uh, you guys are freaking me out, dude. You're taking all like all of the steroids right now. Like, what's going on? <laughs> so it mean, feels no, like not me. <laughs> <laughs> That's damn well what it feels like. Yeah, I mean, every time I see you guys, you're falling asleep, you're out of breath, yeah. or you are asleep and really, really high. <laughs> Two hours. Turn on Two hours autopilot. <laughs> Two hours. It's a good hours late because we're doing injections all morning. Yeah. It's for me. It's, I like the shotgun approach. Because it's just like a gun, it teaches you, uh, it teaches you, I guess, importance and and just when you have to eat a meal next time, eat a meal so you don't have to do something like this again. You're going so extreme, in its extreme results too, but it, it'll make you appreciate the other way too. So I think it's like handling a gun, the respect you have for it. I think it's also going to unveil the current on like the top pro cycles like we basically did a mini version of what some of these guys do year round to maintain those insane oh, physiques and i could barely tolerate seven days so yeah. i mean that opens your mind up to the level of PED, like where peds are at in competitive bodybuilding and you know we might look crazy for doing it for a week but you know this is not a, you know this happens all the time <laughs> It's happening all the time, but like, how dangerous is like, I because like I have no idea, but like from some of like the IG stories that you've been posting, I'm just like, dude, like, <laughs> I'm speak like literally speechless, like I don't even know what to say to it. So like, have you got like, have you two been like, like worried about like, fuck, what does my blood work look like now? It'll be interesting. We're definitely gonna get it <laughs> afterwards. Um, it's gonna so be. It'll be yeah, very interesting to see afterwards. Today was the first day I actually went hypoglycemic during this whole process. I thought it would have happened way earlier, yeah. but, and it was very mild. I caught it really early on. So I was able to, you know, manage it before yeah. I got like the sweats or anything that comes along with being hypo. And what, what motivated you guys to agree to do this? Um, for me, it's 
where we touched on at the very start of the episode is the competition. I have another contest that Tony's okay. going to be doing as well, the Tahoe show in August. And then after that, next year following will be a national show. So, of course, men's physique is always getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So I might have to bring more lean muscle. So this is kind of the perfect opportunity to see what it takes. How about you? Um, I wanted to experience insulin in a controlled environment with those two guys monitoring everything I did. And I honestly was just really, really hyped about showing this side of the industry. Like, this is kept in the corner. No one wants it. No one wants it to be brought up. You know, this plays a big role in how all these supplements get sold, how all these movie roles get filled. And, you know, no one really talks about it. So I was really hyped to participate for a week. And it was only a week. I think I would definitely would have not done this for a month straight. Like, <laughs> I remember there. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, we, they did the DEXA scans, um, their lab work prior to starting. And they're, gonna, they're doing one more of those. Mm -hmm. One more of those. But we check every day glucose. We do blood pressure. We check their heart rate. And then when they get side effects, we correct them. And so people can also see if these things start to arise, don't just keep going. This is what you do to fix it. So it's kind of a double-edged sword, I guess. Yeah, so then is like the, uh, the competition, so that was like the biggest driving factor. Is that like the only driving factor right now? Um, I mean, I always like to just have transparency on my channel. I like yeah. to people to know what's going on in the industry, what pros are taking. So if you have Big Rami claiming natural on stage, you know, <laughs> it's most likely BS, and this is probably what he's doing. Yeah. Um, he's doing around. way so. <laughs> more than this. <laughs> but I just like way people more. to know, you know, that it's not the whey protein powder, it's not the creatine, it's not the pre-workout, it's none of that. It's the hardcore drugs, mm -hmm. the dosages, seeing what's actually going on in the daily life for most of And just of seeing the injections, like people, just injections turn people off. So yeah. just the amount of injections you'll see in this documentary will for sure blow your mind. We have a nice coffee table, just a sea of syringes. Yeah. This so, documentary might be named The Life of a Pincushion. You know? Yeah, literally a pincushion. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we got competition and then like just your overall YouTube channel and stuff. Mm -hmm. I think growing those is really, really important. Brian, like is, I mean, are you planning on competing or is there any like, yeah. I want to compete, but I'm not really looking to be a competitive bodybuilder, but I do want to step on stage. Mm -hmm. For me, it's just, I want to be known to have the most unbiased information on PEDs and build my social media around that. Yeah, what happened to your YouTube channel? Um, it was deleted um, for the links in the description, oh, okay. even though they never told me about them yeah. after emailing them a hundred times. But yeah, that's why I was deleted. Right, and wow. and the same videos I have up on my new channel the same ones. are the same ones and they're fully monetized and I make money off them every month now, you know. Wow. Pretending that he's not standing right next to us, how has the Tony Huge experience been for you guys over the past week? <laughs> uh, no, it's, it's been great. It, it's actually yeah. nice to spend time with Tony because just like anyone, myself included, what you see on social media could be a totally different person in person, mm -hmm. you know. So I think people always, you know, have to be presentable on camera, you know, talk the right way. But when you actually let loose, you know, we're at Tony's house having edibles and having all sorts <laughs> of good fun. So uh, it's definitely a fun scenario and it's good to, you know, get down without all the cameras, of course, rolling right. all the time and get to know each other on that level. Yeah. And you're, you're almost from the area you're in Reno. Reno. Okay. In Pittsburgh, right? Yeah, right, yeah. So it's got to be a little bit of a culture shock, right? Like it's I've I've been to Tony's before. I actually came out okay. to Tony's when I was eighteen, and then you know I've been to the Olympia, the Arnold with them. So I'm pretty seasoned on Tony's shenanigans, and <laughs> you know I pretty much knew everything to expect when I went here, and it was the same old Tony. Yeah. I mean, I th feel like people think they take Tony as this womanizer, and he's all extreme, but he's really a nice dude in person. I wish Tony would just show more of himself chilling out because he kind of puts on the pep when the cameras turn on. But behind the scenes, he's very chill. Big teddy bear. Yeah. Yeah. Very open minded. <laughs> cool, man. Um, so you guys have anything coming up that you want to promote? This will probably be, probably be like another two months before anybody even sees this. So I know you were kind of joking around about something you had coming up uh, on your YouTube channel. Um, if you want to promote anything or. Ooh. 
I, I always like it hidden. I don't want people to know what to oh, expect yeah. on the channel. Well, then where can people find you and promote your YouTube channel? Um, <laughs> YouTube, of course, Kenny KO. Search it. You'll find it. Um, Instagram, real Kenny KO, all one word. And yeah, you guys can stay updated with everything I'm doing. Of course, I'll be at all the expos, Olympia, Arnold, LA Fit Expo. Calling people out. Yeah, doing the usual. <laughs> How about you, Trevor? Where can people find you? Um, Through Tony. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I mean, the real coach, Trevor, is the Instagram. But um, responding to all of them is hard. So Yeah. 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 So huge. <laughs> so the documentary Enhanced 2 is going to come out roughly January 2020. But the behind the scenes filming is going on YouTube. And there's it's on it's called Enhanced Transformations on the Dr. Tony Huge YouTube channel. And there's multiple transformations going to happen throughout the documentary. So we have the 20 pounds in 30 days. And then we have Kenny and Russo putting on as much muscle in seven days as possible. And then we're going to build a girl's butt as big as possible. And we're going to do an extreme fat loss protocol. And then we're going to do Kenny and I preparing for the Tahoe show competition behind the scenes also. So whole bunch of Dr. Tony huge style transformations coming up where we, use the anabolic matrix theory. We're using synergy between different pathways of either fat loss or growth and showing people how the chemistry all fits together to educate people so they can make informed decisions about what they want to do with their body. Gotcha. Ryan, what you got? <laughs> and then, so I have another YouTube channel called Ryan Russo. Um, if you're looking for informational videos on anything PD related, I pretty much make them completely unbiased. So, I do a lot of reading out of the Anabolics Encyclopedia book, and then I'll combine it with my own personal experiences, and then you have me documenting my cycles. And then what's new is that Tony launched AnabolicTV.com, and that's going to be an uncensored video f platform for bodybuilders. That's also going to be an uncensored form. So I have my own channel on there. I can make a lot better content for that one, a lot more hardcore content. I don't have to be PG-13. And then I frequently try and post stories and make content for my Instagram, at Russo Lifts. And if you want to try and talk to me, that's probably the best way to get a hold of me right now. Just don't send shirtless pics. Yeah, yeah no, no dick pics, please. <laughs> I get enough of those. Happy one time was before I knew who you were. <laughs> but yeah, uh, for me it's just at I am Andrew Z on Instagram that's the easiest and best way to get hold of me uh, thank you guys so much for taking the time I know you guys need to get uh, what leg workout or what yeah it's it's leg day and then we hit our growth hormone insulin and we go eat food and then we go get our final DEXA scan to see how much muscle we put on versus fat sick I will let you guys get after it thank you again so much I really appreciate it guys yeah, thank, thank you, you for having us appreciate it man